curious about becoming a fashion lawyer? Well, you're in luck because in today's video, we are diving into what fashion law is and what it actually looks like to practice it. If you guys are new to the channel, welcome. I'm Angela Vorpal of AngelaVorpal.com and the Law School Network Facebook group. And the truth of the matter is that there are hundreds of different types of legal practice areas out there. And most of us have zero idea what any of them actually are or what lawyers in them actually do, even when we're heading into law school or as practicing lawyers. And so the idea behind this series is to give you guys an inside look into different areas of the law and really dig into what it means to practice those types of of law. But before we dive in, make sure to check out the what type of law should I practice quiz so you can first get a sense of what your natural strengths and abilities and interests may lend themselves to in the practice of law. So check that out. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in. To walk us through what fashion law is and what it looks like to practice it is the wonderful Francesca Witzberg. Francesca is an award-winning IP and contracts attorney who helps businesses and brands stay protected and profitable. She represents an array of different different industries and fashion clients. Francesca, thank you so much for being with us. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, Angela, so much for having me today. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so can you give us the down and dirty version of what fashion law actually is? Sure. So fashion law is a really broad term that's used to encompass a variety of different legal areas. So um, when people say they're a fashion lawyer, what it really means is they are attorneys that advise clients that are in the fashion industry. Those clients can be brands or they could be designers, they could be startups. Um, it really covers the gamut, but it's just an easy term to capture all of that. Amazing. Okay. So 10 second version um, is super incredibly helpful. And then can you give us the slightly longer version of what actually practicing fashion law might look like? Yes. So I like touched on it briefly, but really there is no technical type of law called fashion law, right? You are either a generalist or a transactional attorney that advises clients in the fashion industry, or you are a real estate lawyer, um, import, export, tax, the litigator, IP, intellectual property, and that's I, what um, the acronym IP is. So that type of law is typically more commonly associated with fashion because when you think fashion, you think design protection and brands and logos, but really that's definitely a myth. There's a lot of lawyers who call themselves fashion lawyers that are not just intellectual property lawyers. Wonderful. And can you walk us through what a typical week might look like for you when you start, when you stop and some of the projects you're working on for your fashion clients? Yes. Okay. So being an IP lawyer, um, it means a lot of things. I should clarify that, that I really specialize with trademarks, copyrights, and then contracts that are related to those two areas. So my day-to-day -day really, just generally speaking, involves a lot of clearance work. Um, so when clients come to me and say, Francesca, I have this new name or um, a new business name for a product or a service, I will do a trademark search to see what the risk level is associated with use of that new name. We give them a report and then they say, okay, I want to go ahead and get it on file. And then we get it on file. That's a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the other part is general counseling. So a client who may already have trademarks registered, they either want to expand into a new area or a new category, or maybe they're working with brand partners and influencers. Um, I'll strategize on how to really structure the deal. Some of the terms and we'll make sure that all of their rights are protected with those those right trademark and copyright filings and then also with the contracts and then specifically for my fashion clients it's pretty much the same usually it's either if they're if they're startup clients the most important thing is the name, right? Making sure that their name is available and just because they're they could be a designer just because it's your birth name or your legal name doesn't necessarily mean that you have rights to use that name in connection with clothing. And so that's something that happens a lot. And when you're dealing with personal name trademarks, there's so much that comes up to it. We could have a whole conversation about it separately, but I generally advise clients on all of that, picking the right name, 
making sure it's available and then getting it on file. And then on the copyright side and the design side of things, there's really a lot we can do. Um, US law is pretty, is it's pretty challenging to protect fashion designs themselves, but there's definitely IP tools available. And so that's my job is when the client comes to me and we look at their business as a whole and we figure out what IP tools are available to actually protect their businesses, their brands and their designs. Fantastic. And can you let us know what sector of the legal industry you would consider yourself working in? Yes. So I work for what's called an intellectual property boutique firm. What that means is we're about 50, about 50 attorneys all over the United States, and we just specialize in intellectual property. We're not a full service firm where we have real estate, other areas. It's just IP. So I work with patent lawyers and people who are experts in trade secrets, but my area is trademarks and copyrights. And so what we're seeing more and more of is I used to work in big law, which is a different sector. And I moved to an IP boutique firm last year. And what's really been interesting is to see that clients and the same clients are really still coming to me. So whether or not they are bigger brands that want more flexible billing arrangements or the specialists that are at my firm um, or their startup clients that just need to get a couple trademarks on file, that's really um, the, the benefit of working with the boutique firm. You have that flexibility to kind of run the gamut of any type of fashion client. All right, so let's get down to the logistics. How much would you say that you typically work? Ooh, this is such an interesting question because I feel like I am always working, but the really cool thing about being a partner and being more entrepreneurial is that that for me includes all the marketing and the con the, the building of relationships. So if I had to put a number on that and split my time between business development and the networking versus actual real, you know, billable legal work, I would say right now at this point in my career, it's 50 50 because I did leave. Um, I did leave a salaried position as an associate in big law to become a partner and build a book of business. And I started with no clients in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of lockdown. So I really needed to hustle, create a social media presence and get clients. So at the beginning, it was honestly probably like 70% um, was the marketing and 30% was legal work. Now I'm gradually getting to more and more of, of the legal work, which is super exciting and great. But um, it's, I would say it's about 50-50 when compared to clearly my other job, billables were the most important thing. Yes, law firms always encourage associates to do the networking, but when it comes down to it, they really only care about you hitting your billable hours. And what would you say a typical day looks like as a big law associate versus now a partner in an IP litigation boutique? So one of the major things is that I don't have a salary anymore. <laughs> it's like kind of, I don't know if anyone has heard this before, it's the eat what you kill model, which is kind of like an interesting, funny uh, a name. But it, it really, it really is great for people who are energetic and enthusiastic and like the networking and like the business development. And that was something that I always loved. And like I said, as much as the firm encouraged me to do it at the end of the day, I had to hit my billables. So you really don't get to prioritize that much of the networking and all that stuff. Billing is the most important. But now um, I'm able to actually spend all that time in the marketing. And for me, that's been, it's been huge. It's a little scary for people who are thinking about it or who, who are moving to um, maybe a, a, a different type of firm where you don't have a salary, where everything is a percentage of what you bring in and what you work on, but it has been changed my life it has given me the tools that i need to really thrive personally and professionally and i um and it, and it highlights my skill sets like i said with all of the things that i like to do all the marketing and if you're willing to share with us how much do you make a year compared now to when you were a big law associate 
Yeah, I will say, so I was a big law associate in Manhattan and, you know, you can literally Google what the Skadden and all of the big law um, white shoe firms starting salaries are. It's probably in the 200s of thousands right now. Um, so it, my salary was definitely around there by being a fifth year associate. I would say it was in around that range and leaving. It was kind of scary, like, oh, my gosh, I'm giving away this the salary and the stability to potentially, I don't know, potentially make no money, right? That fear is there. But I had confidence in myself and I knew that I could do this and it really paid off. And I will likely be making more than I than I was at my big law job. Yes. So TBD on that front. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. And I wanted to ask you, what is the, what would you say is the most fun part of your job and what is the worst part of your job? Okay. I love like the general counseling. I like the creative aspect. So I get to brainstorm with clients. It's not just them coming to me with problems. I like to be a preventative and a proactive lawyer. So I like to catch people early. A lot of my content is about how to protect things and build like a fortress around your business using IP tools and empowering people. So it's really fun when I get them when they're happy and excited to actually register their names and protect their businesses in really creative ways. Um, I hate <laughs> the litigation aspect. I don't like getting demand letters. I don't like responding to them. Um, it's it's just something that clearly being adversarial, I, I don't really enjoy. But when you're in when you're an associate, you have to do it all, right? Like you do what you're told. So, um, but now as a partner, I get to decide, right? And I've made the decision to not really do litigation. Um, and I have amazing partners at my firm who are able to step in. Like one of my colleagues loves litigation. She's like the nicest person on the planet and like super smart. So I'm like, okay, here you go. This doesn't stress you out. You can, you can do all the litigation stuff. And I don't just pass it off. I really, cause I'm very close to my clients and, um, I, so I, I manage the litigation. I will still be involved. I'll still work with the, the litigator to make sure that we're making the right decisions and settling at the right time or maybe doing the right tactics and keeping budget down. So that part I like, but not the actual litigation. And what steps did you take in law school or right after law school to actually get into fashion law? It starts in law school. So, um, and my situation is unique, but I, I, I think it's important for everyone to hear whether or not you're in a big city or you're not. So I worked in, in Manhattan, uh, I'm sorry, I went to law school in Manhattan at Benjamin Cardoza Law, which literally is in the middle of Manhattan with um, Parsons right next door and the new school. So it was all really like fashion and, and, and art and, really exciting when I be, when I went there and I didn't know in law school that that was even a thing that you could actually represent artists and fashion designers and fashion brands. It was something so cool that um, stood out to me very early on in my 1L year. But as everyone knows who's been through law school, 1L isn't really focused on, oh, what kind of lawyer you want to be? You have to focus on grades and all that stuff. So um, but after my 1L semester, I quickly realized I learned how to study. I learned how to get better grades. And so I had that kind of down. And then I pivoted to think, what internships do I want to get to set myself up for a job in that type of industry? So I ended up meeting a, a Cardozo alum who was the head of a company called Diamonds International. So it was a jewelry company that they sat in Rock Center and he offered me an in-house internship my 1L year, which was really cool. And um, I credit all of that to like the networking and the, pro the proactiveness that I had as a second semester 1L. And then I leveraged that to be able to apply for for more fashion um, internships. So that that's jewelry, but still it's in this like realm of fashion, accessories, all that. And I interned at Prada for the year. 
Then I leveraged that to go on to intern at Tory Burch for the year. So you may be thinking, okay, Francesca, like I'm not in New York City and and it's 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 true the fact that is I was in New York you could walk down the street and I would be at the Tory Burch office but I have an amazing incredible friend okay who went to law school in DC and she was determined to be in fashion she's she's in fashion today she has an amazing role and it's because she decided and said I'm going to work summers so she applied for fashion jobs during the summer internship position so just because you're not located in a city where they have these types of jobs it's okay you should be messaging people and getting set up and applying for some jobs during the school year so that you can go in the summer my friend took it one step further she wanted the the annual experience she wanted the spring and fall semester internship experience at well so she did uh, semesters at my law school to be able to take some of the fashion classes that they had and get access to some of those internships. So don't just say, no, I can't do it because you're limited to where you are. There's ways, if you really want something bad enough, you can make it happen. Oh my gosh, that's such incredible advice. Thank you so much for sharing all of those stories with us. And to wrap up our conversation about fashion law, what would you personally rate it on a scale of one to 10 in terms of how much you enjoy it and how much you would recommend it as a practice area to someone else? Oh, it's a 10. I mean, especially for intellectual prop, like intellectual property is just a 10 itself. I really love what I do every day. I get to help brands and creative people protect their businesses, their creations, and these beautiful assets that they've worked. And sometimes, you know, actually a lot of times they are creatives right they they may not know a lot of the business side or especially the legal side which can be really complicated so it's really great and i see it as like philanthropic in a sense to be able to give the law to people and those type of creatives in a very easy to understand way and helping them protect their businesses so yeah totally a 10. that's so wonderful francesca thank you so much for joining us on today's video. And if people want to learn more, if they want to reach out to you, where is the best place to find you? Go to Instagram. I'm at the trademark attorney on Instagram and you can click on the link in my bio to find out more about me on my website, francescawitzberg.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Francesca. I appreciate it so much. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it gave you some insight into the practice area of fashion law. And if you guys are interested in checking out more videos like this one, definitely take a look at these two videos over here. And if you want to be notified every time that I drop a new video so you don't miss out on anything, be sure to subscribe over here. And with that, guys, I will see you in the next one. Bye.